Hey guys, how's it going? In this video, we're going to go over section 1, i.e. the multiple choice questions from the 2017 Specimen SQA National 5 Physics exam paper. Now, there are 25 questions in this section, and I recommend that you try them yourself before looking at these solutions. So let's get started. Question 1 says, which of the following contains two scalar quantities? So we've got force and mass, weight and mass, displacement and speed, distance and speed, and displacement and velocity. And for this question, we need to remember what a scalar actually is. So remember, a scalar quantity is a quantity that has a magnitude or size only. It doesn't have a direction. So if we look at the first one, force and mass, force is a vector, remember, so it's not going to be that one. And in B, weight is a type of force, so that means weight is also a vector, so it's not going to be B. For C, displacement is a vector, so it's not going to be C. For D, we've got distance and speed. Now that is going to be our our answer because distance and speed are both scalars. And lastly, displacement and velocity, they are both vectors, so it's not going to be that one. So the answer is D. Question 2 says that a student sets up the apparatus shown. So we've got a trolley with a card and it's passing down this ramp to reach a light gate which is connected to a computer and we've got these two points X and Y. It says the trolley is released from X and moves down the ramp. The following measurements are recorded. So we've got the time for the car to pass through the light gate, which is 0.08 seconds, the distance from X to Y, so from here to here, which is 0.5 meters, and the length of the card on the trolley is 0.04 meters. It then says the instantaneous speed of the trolley at Y is. So if we look back at our data here, remember to find the instantaneous speed of an object. We need to use speed, distance, time. But the distance is not going to be the distance between x and y. That would be for if we were calculating average speed, we'd be using the distance between two light gates. However, here we've only got the one light gate for instantaneous speed, and we should remember that the distance we use for instantaneous speed is actually the width or the length of the card on the trolley. So that's going to give us our distance, and we've also got the time for that card to pass through the light gate, which is 0.08 seconds. So we're going to use the length of the card divided by the time, and that's going to give us the instantaneous speed. So we have d equals vt. We can then rearrange for the speed v to get v equals d over t. We can then sub in the numbers to get 0.04 over 0.08. And you can then put that into your calculator or just identify that on the top we have half of what's on the bottom. So that's going to give us 0.5 meters per second for our answer, which is option A. So the answer here is A. Question 3 says a block of mass 3 kilograms is pulled across a horizontal bench by a force of 20 newtons as shown below. So we've got this 3 kilogram block and a forward or thrust force of 20 newtons to the left. Then says the block accelerates at 4 meters per second squared. The force of friction between the block and the bench is. Well notice here we're given the mass, we're given the acceleration and also the forward force. However, if we want to find what the force of friction acting to the right is, it's probably a good idea to first find the unbalanced force which is going to make this object move to the left. And once we know the unbalanced force, we can then work out what the difference is between the unbalanced force and this forward or thrust force to find out what the frictional force is. So first let's find the unbalanced force using F equals MA, Newton's second law. We can then sub in the mass and the acceleration to get 3 times 4, which is 12 newtons. So if the unbalanced force is 12 newtons, or in other words, the difference between the forward force and the frictional force is 12 newtons, then that means that the friction force must be 20 minus the 12, which is equal to 8 newtons. So our answer here is B. Question 4 says that an aircraft engine exerts a force on the air. Which of the following completes the Newton pair of forces? So remember to do these kind of questions involving Newton's third law or Newton pairs. We take the words in the action force and we just swap the words round. So for the action force, we have an aircraft engine exerts a force on the air, but the reaction is going to be the opposite of that. So it's going to be the force of the air on the aircraft engine. And you'll see here we have the force of the air on the aircraft engine for option A. So the answer here is going to be A. Question 5 says that a trolley of mass 0.5 kilograms has a kinetic energy of 0.36 joules. The speed of the trolley is. Well, this question mentions the phrase kinetic energy, and it's also talking about mass and speed. So we're going to be dealing with the kinetic energy equation, ek equals a half mv squared. And we want to find the speed v. So we can sub in the numbers first, so that gives us 0.36 equals a half times 0.5 times v squared. And we can then simplify both sides to get v squared equals 1.44. But remember, we want the speed, not the speed squared. So we need to take the square root of that to get v equals 1.2 meters per second, which you can do in your calculator. You'll notice we have that as option C here, 1.2 meters per second, which means our answer is C. 
Moving on, we have question six, which says a ball is released from rest and allowed to roll down a curved track as shown. So the ball starts up here, it rolls along the curved track and it reaches this height here, which is 0.2 meters lower than where it was to begin with at the start. So if it was 0.8 meters above the track here, then that means this distance up here is going to be 0.8 minus the 0.2, which is 0.6 meters. Then says the mass of the ball is 0.5 kilograms. The maximum height reached on the opposite side of the track is 0.2 meters lower than the height of the starting point, which we've already seen. And it then says the amount of energy lost is. Well, firstly, you should realize that the ball reaches this lower height than it was at initially due to a loss in energy. And specifically, we're dealing with an object raised above the ground, which means it's going to be gravitational potential energy we're thinking about. So the ball, when it's at this height, will have gravitational potential energy, and it's also going to have a different gravitational potential energy at this lower height here. So in order to find the amount of energy lost, I'm simply going to find the gravitational potential energy at each of these heights and then subtract them. So we can say that the energy lost is equal to the change in gravitational potential energy EP, which I'm going to make equal to EP2 minus EP1, where EP2 is my first gravitational potential energy at a height of 0.8 meters, and EP1 is my second gravitational potential energy at a height of 0.6 meters above the ground. And let's now substitute in our expressions for gravitational potential energy. Remember EP equals MGH. So I'm gonna write MGH2 minus MGH1, just labeling my two heights. And we could then just sub in the numbers or or we could factorize here by taking an mg outside the brackets and having h2 minus h1 inside the brackets because the mg parts are identical in both. So this is equal to mg times h2 minus h1. But if you think that's too confusing, don't worry, just sub in the numbers at this stage. But this is equal to mg times h2 minus h1. And we can then put in the numbers to get 0.5 times 9.8, which is gravitational field strength on Earth times 0.8 minus 0.6. Remember, we're using that 0.6 because it's the height above the ground, not the 0.2, because that's just telling us the difference from the starting height, not the ground. And putting those numbers into your calculator should give you an answer of 0.98 joules. Now you'll see that is option C, which means our answer is C. Question seven says the Mars Curiosity rover has a mass of 900 kilograms. Which row in the table gives the mass and weight of the rover on Mars? Well, we can do the mass easily, first of all, because you should remember that mass stays the same no matter where you are in the universe. So if the mass of the rover is 900 kilograms on the Earth, then it's going to be 900 kilograms on Mars as well. So that means we're looking at C, D and E as options here. We can eliminate A and B from being an answer. So now let's think how we can calculate the weight. Well, remember we have an equation W equals mg to calculate weight. We can then sub in the numbers 900 kilograms for the mass times 3.7 newtons per kilogram, which is the gravitational field strength on Mars, which you'll find on the data sheet. Putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 3,330 newtons. And you'll see that as an option here, so we have D as our answer. Question 8 says a student makes the following statements about the universe. Statement 1 says the Big Bang Theory is a theory about the origin of the universe. Statement 2, the universe is approximately 14 million years old. And statement 3, the universe is expanding. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, let's look through each statement and decide which ones are true and which ones are false. So statement 1, the Big Bang Theory is a theory about the origin of the universe that is true. Because remember, the Big Bang Theory attempts to explain how the universe came to be. And therefore, it's trying to explain the origin of the universe. And it's a theory, which means it may or may not be correct. For statement two, the universe is approximately 14 million years old. This is not the case because remember, the universe is approximately 14 billion years old, not 14 million years old. And to be more precise, it's nearer about 13.8 billion years old or 13.8 times 10 to the nine years old. And lastly, statement three, the universe is expanding. This is true. And remember, there's lots of evidence to support this, such as Redshift and Hubble's law. So that means we have statements one and three that are correct, which is the answer D. Question 9 says that a conductor carries a current of 4.0 microamps for 250 seconds. The total charge passing a point in the conductor is. Well, this is asking about charge and we've got a current and a time. So we're looking to use the equation relating charge, current and time, which is Q equals IT. However, notice we have the prefix micro here, which we need to be aware of. So subbing in the numbers, we get 4.0 times 10 to the minus 6, which is the microamps times 250 for the time. And that was in seconds, so we didn't need to convert it. You can then put that into your calculator to get a final answer of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. And you'll see that is option B here. 
Question 10 says that a uniform electric field exists between plates Q and R. The diagram shows the path taken by a particle as it passes through the field. So we have particle P passing straight along until it reaches this electric field between plates Q and R, at which point it's going to curve up towards plate Q and away from plate R. It then says which row in the table identifies the charge in the particle, the charge in plate Q and the charge in plate R. And you'll notice the options we have here are negative, no charge or positive. So looking back at the picture, we need to decide on the combination that's going to allow this particle to be attracted to plate Q and repelled away from plate R. So in order for the particle to be attracted to plate Q, then P and Q must have an opposite charge. And in order for P to be repelled away from plate R, it must have the same charge as R. So let's look at our table to find which columns have the same charge for P and R. So here's the particle P and here's R. For A, we've got the same charge, negative and negative. For B, we've got opposite charges. For C, we've got different charges. For D, we've got different charges. And for E, we've got different charges. So the only option here that we can go for is going to be A. So let's just see that that makes sense. So we get negative for the particle, negative for plate R, and positive for plate Q. Let's look at the picture. So we're saying that the particle P is negative, so imagine an electron coming in, for example, and let's say this was negative and this was positive, then the electron is going to be repelled away from the negative plate and attracted towards the positive plate, so that makes sense. So to conclude, the answer was A. Question 11 says 1 volt is equivalent to, we've got 1 ampere per watt, 1 coulomb per second, 1 joule per coulomb, 1 joule per second, or 1 watt per second. Well remember this question is kind of like a definitions question. So in order to find what 1 volt is equivalent to, we need to know the definition of the volt, or voltage, or potential difference. So remember we can say the voltage of an electrical supply is the energy given to each coulomb of charge which passes through the supply. So notice how we're talking about energy given to each coulomb. And remember energy is measured in joules and coulombs is the unit of charge. So we have joules per coulomb. So we have that one volt is equivalent to one joule per coulomb, which is the option C here. Question 12 says in the circuit shown the current in each resistor is different. So we have two cells to make a battery. We then have two combinations of parallel resistors and we have a 100 ohm resistor in the middle here. It then says in which resistor is the current smallest? Well, to answer this, we first want to think about the relationship between current and resistance. Remember, resistance is the opposition to current flow, so it means that we have a sort of inverse relationship between the two. So the bigger one is, the smaller the other one is. So if we want the resistor with the smallest current flowing through it, then it's probably going to be the resistor with the biggest resistance value. However, that would suggest that we're looking at this 100 ohm resistor here. However, notice how the 100 ohm is not actually in parallel, it's in the series part of this circuit, and we need to also remember that current splits up through each branch in a parallel circuit. So that means that the current passing through the battery is actually going to be split up when it reaches this section here. And then it's going to combine again when it passes through the 100 ohm resistor, and then it's going to split up again through these resistors. So therefore, it's not going to just be the resistor with the biggest resistance value, which has the smallest current flowing through it, because the current's going to be bigger here than it is in the parallel sections. And therefore, we can say that current will be smallest in the resistor with the largest resistance value in parallel, not in series. So we're looking at the two parallel parts, and we can see the resistor with the biggest resistance value in parallel is going to be this 50 ohm resistor here. So therefore, the 50 ohm resistor is going to have the smallest current flowing through it. So that gives us an answer of D. Question 13 says that five students each carry out an experiment to determine the specific heat capacity of copper. The setup used by each student is shown. So we have student 1, student 2, student 3, student 4, and student 5. It then says the student with the setup that would allow the most accurate value for the specific heat capacity of copper to be determined is. Well, let's look back at each setup and compare them. So student one, you'll see, has a power supply. You've got a thermometer there inside the block as well, and that looks pretty decent. However, student two's is identical with some insulation around it, and that's going to be good to try and trap in any heat that might otherwise be lost to the surroundings. For student three, you'll see we have the immersion heater sort of lifted half out of the copper block, which isn't very good. For student four, we have the thermometer, which is actually taken out of the block as well, which again, isn't ideal. And for student 5, we do have insulation and we do have the immersion heater inside the block. However, again, just like student 4, we have the thermometer outside of the block. So that's not going to be very helpful to give us an accurate value of temperature. So the best setup here is going to be student 2's, which has the insulation and all of the devices where they should be inside the block. So we can say the answer here is student 2, which is B. 
Question 14 says that three resistors are connected as shown. So we have two terminals X and Y, and we've got two 8 ohm resistors and a 4 ohm resistor in parallel. Then says the resistance between X and Y is. So in order to find the total resistance in parallel, we need to use the relationship 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. We can then sub in the numbers to get 1 over 8 plus 1 over 8 plus 1 over 4. And at this point, you can put that straight into your calculator and make that do the work for you. Or you can use the lowest common denominator method, which I'll do here. So you can see that 4 goes into 8, so we can leave the 8s alone and 4 goes into 8 twice, so we can multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by 2, so we get 1 over 8 plus 1 over 8 plus 2 over 8, which simplifies to 4 over 8, and then because this is 1 over RT, we need to swap both sides to get RT on its own. So we get RT equals 8 over 4, which is the same as RT equals 2 ohms. So that gives us an answer of C here. Question 15 says that a heater is immersed in a substance. The heater is then switched on. The graph shows the temperature of the substance over a period of time. So you've got a temperature in degrees Celsius on the y-axis and time in seconds on the x-axis. And we've got this heating curve here because the zigzags are going up the way. It then says which row in the table identifies the sections in the graph when the substance is changing state. So for solid to liquid and liquid to gas, we want two letters together which represent sections on our graph. So first of all, let's assume we have a solid substance at P and we apply heat to that substance. Then its temperature is going to increase over time until it reaches its melting point at Q, at which point the solid is going to melt into a liquid between Q and R. And that is the change in state happening there. And at point R, we can say that all of that solid has been converted into a liquid. So remember, the change in state happens at a constant temperature. From R to S, our liquid is then going to increase in temperature until it reaches its boiling point at point S. And at point S, our liquid is going to start evaporating into a gas. And at point T, we can say that the liquid has been completely evaporated into a gas. So again, we have a change in state here from liquid to gas between S and T. And between T and U, we just have our gas increasing in temperature, but no further further change in state. So Q and R is our first change in state from solid to liquid, and S to T is our second change in state from liquid to gas. So looking at our table, we have QR and ST, which is the answer B. Question 16 says a bicycle pump is sealed at one end and the piston pushed until the pressure of the trapped air is 4.00 times 10 to the 5 pascals. So you've got your trapped air in here which is your volume of the gas and we're moving the piston in to decrease the volume. It then says the area of the piston compressing the air is 5.00 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared. The force that the trapped air exerts on the piston is. Well notice we're given pressure here and also the area and we're asked to calculate force so we're going to use the relationship between pressure, force and area which is P equals F over A. So you can either substitute in the numbers here or rearrange to calculate the force. So I'm going to rearrange for force by multiplying the pressure and area together. So we get F equals P times A and then substituting in the numbers gives us 4.00 times 10 to the 5 times 5.00 times 10 to the minus 4. Putting that into your calculator should give you an answer of 200 newtons. And with the two zeros there that's the same as writing 2.00 times 10 to the 2 newtons which is answer C. Question 17 says a liquid is heated from 17 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. The temperature rise in Kelvin is. Well, remember that a temperature change in Kelvin is identical to a temperature change in degrees Celsius. So we just need to find the difference between these two temperatures and that's going to tell us the temperature rise in Kelvin. So we could write the change in temperature delta T is equal to T2 minus T1. Substituting in the numbers, we get 50 minus 17, which is a difference of 33 degrees Celsius. So we can say the temperature rise in Kelvin is going to be the same as that, so it's 33 Kelvin, i.e. answer A. Question 18 says the following diagram shows a wave. So from this crest to this crest we have a distance of 12 metres and we've got a full vertical height of 0.2 metres. It then says which row in the table gives the wavelength and amplitude of the wave. Well, to find wavelength, first of all, remember wavelength is defined in general terms as the distance from one point on a wave to the same point on the next wave. Or you could also define it as from one crest to the next crest or from one trough to the next trough. So because the distance starts at a crest here, we might as well just use the crests. So going from crest to crest is going to be one wavelength, but you'll notice here we have from crest to crest to crest, so that is actually two wavelengths. So in order to find one wavelength, we just divide the 12 by 2. So we have lambda equals 12 over 2, which is 6 meters for the wavelength. 
So our answer is either going to be B or C here. Remember amplitude is defined as half the vertical height of the wave. So from the crest to the axis or the trough to the axis. So that's going to be half of 0.2 meters. So we can say that amplitude equals 0.2 over 2, which is equal to 0.1 meters. So that means our answer here is B. Question 19 says a wave machine in a swimming pool generates 15 waves per minute. The wavelength of these waves is 2.0 meters. The frequency of the waves is. Well, we're given the number of waves as 15. We're told that happens per minute. So that's essentially telling us the time in seconds is going to be 60 seconds. And we're given the wavelength. And remember, we can find frequency using number of waves and time. So I'm going to use the number of waves 15 and the time of 60 seconds because we want minutes and seconds. So we can use the relationship f equals n over t, substitute in the numbers 15 divided by 60, and you can either do that in your head because 15 is a quarter of 60, or you can put it into your calculator. So that gives us 0 0.25 hertz. And you'll see that is answer A. Notice we didn't use the wavelength here. That is what we call a distractor. It's there to try and put you off, but we didn't actually need to use the number. Next we have question 20 and it says the diagram shows members of the electromagnetic spectrum in order of increasing wavelength. So we've got gamma rays, P, ultraviolet radiation, Q, infrared, R, TV and radio waves and we've got increasing wavelength along this way. Which row in the table identifies the radiations represented by the letters P, Q and R? Well the way I remember this and the way we discussed in the theory video for the electromagnetic spectrum is we started off at this end and we remember it in this order for decreasing wavelength. So we start off with radio and TV, we then have microwaves for R, we then have infrared, visible light for Q, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. So that means we have x-rays for P, visible light for Q and microwaves for R, which you'll see is the option A. Question 21 says a ray of red light is instant on a glass block as shown. So we have the air here, glass block here, and the light is coming in this way and bending towards a normal like that because it's going from a less dense material into a more dense material. So we expect it to bend towards the normal. We're then given some angles here of 30 degrees in here and 55 degrees in here. And we've got the normal here as well. It then says which row in the table shows the values of the angle of instance and angle of refraction? Well, looking back at the picture, remember the angle of instance is defined as the angle measured between the normal and the instant ray. And that means it's going to be this angle in here. So because this whole angle is going to be 90 degrees here. To find this angle we simply just need to do 90 minus the 30 to give us 60 degrees. And then for the angle of refraction, remember that is defined as the angle measured between the normal and the refracted ray, which is going to be this angle in here. So again, because this makes an angle of 90 degrees here, then in order to get this angle, we simply need to do 90 minus the 55 to get this angle here, which is going to be 35 degrees. For the angle of instance I, we said it was 90 minus 30, which is 60 degrees. And for the angle of refraction R, we said it was 90 minus the 55, which is 35 degrees. And you can see we have the options here of 60 and 35 for answer E. Question 22 says, which of the following describes the term ionization? Well, remember ionization refers to the addition or removal of an electron from an atom. So our options are an atom losing an orbiting electron, an atom losing a proton, a nucleus emitting an alpha particle, a nucleus emitting a neutron, or a nucleus emitting a gamma ray. Well, the one there that matches our definition of ionization is going to be A, an atom losing an orbiting electron. Moving on to question 23, it says a student writes the following statements about the activity of a radioactive source. Statement 1 says the activity decreases with time. Statement 2 says the activity is measured in becquerels. And statement 3, the activity is the number of decays per second. Which of these statements is or are correct? Well, let's look at each statement in turn and decide which ones are true or false. For statement 1, the activity decreases with time. That is true because remember, activity of a radioactive source will always start off high and always get lower over time. And you can think about the typical graph of activity of a radioactive source against time, which always shows an exponentially decaying curve. So that shows that activity decreases over time. So that is true. For statement two, the activity is measured in becquerels. So you either know that or you don't, but that is true because remember becquerels is the unit of activity, capital B, small q. And lastly, the activity is the number of decays per second. That is also true. And you can think about the equation for that A equals N over T, where N is the number of decays or disintegrations and T is time. So that is our definition of activity. So we have all statements are correct. So our answer is E. 
Question 24 says that a worker in a nuclear power station is exposed to 3.00 milligrays of gamma radiation and 0.500 milligrays of fast neutrons. The total equivalent dose received by the worker is. Well, notice how we've got two different types of radiation here and we're asked for the total equivalent dose. So we simply just need to find the equivalent dose for each of these separately using the equation H equals DWR for equivalent dose, and then we add them together at the end. So let's do gamma first of all. So for gamma rays, H equals DWR, we can sub in our numbers for three milligrays. We have 3.00 times 10 to the minus three, which is us converting from milligrays into grays. And then we times that by one because that is the radiation weighting factor for gamma radiation from the data sheet. And this is the same as just 3.00 times 10 to the minus 3 sieverts. We could then just convert that back into millisieverts to be the same as the units for the answer options here. So we have 3.00 millisieverts. And now let's do the same for fast neutrons. So for fast neutrons, H equals DWR, we have 0 0.500 times 10 to the minus 3, just again converting from milligrays into grays. And then we times that by 10 because 10 is the radiation weighting factor for fast neutrons from the data sheet. We can then put that into our calculator or just do it in your head to see that will become 5.00 times 10 to the minus 3 sieverts. And then converting back into millisieverts, we have 5.00 millisieverts. So adding these together to get the total equivalent dose, we have 3 plus 5, which gives us 8 millisieverts. And that gives us the answer B. Also notice in this question how I converted from milligrays into grays to do the calculations and then converted back. You don't actually need to do that. You could just leave the numbers in milligrays here and use 3 times 1 and 0 0.5 times 10, as long as you remember to put your final answer in millisieverts. Lastly, question 25 says that in a nuclear reactor, a chain reaction releases energy from nuclei. Which of the following statements describes the beginning of a chain reaction? Well, straight away we can eliminate some of our answers here because remember a chain reaction is all to do with nuclear fission and in just nuclear fission always involves a neutron going in to hit a nucleus of an atom. So that means we can eliminate the electron and proton statements here because they're talking about an electron or a proton going in to split a nucleus. But we know it's going to be a neutron, not an electron or a proton. So our answer is either going to be D or E here, but let's just read them. So we've got a neutron splits a nucleus releasing electrons, or a neutron splits a nucleus releasing more neutrons. Well, remember in a nuclear fission reaction and in a chain reaction, it's going to be neutrons that are released that go on to hit other nuclei and cause them to split through further nuclear fission reactions. So our answer here has got to be E. We're not dealing with electrons, we're dealing with neutrons. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.